So, who remembers the Millennium Bug? It was going to be the end of the world, wasn't it? All the banking systems were going to crash, planes were going to fall all out of the sky, we wouldn't be able to get any money, it was going to be chaos. There were signs up everywhere telling us to get us computer systems in order. They even remind us to turn this computer off before midnight. So, with the end of the world looming, what did I do? Well, of course, I did what most of us did, and headed to the pub and waited for the chaos. So, New Year's Day came. I woke up with a hangover from hell. My debit card was still working. There wasn't a 747 parked in the garden. Um, so it looks like we never got a Millennium Bug. Or was there a different kind of Millennium Bug? Well, actually there was, and it went by the name of the flu. So, here we see the flu from 2000. As we can see, four to five times higher than a normal year, and it was officially an epidemic. As we can see, there was almost a vertical climb in the number of deaths, and these are deaths by the way, not cases. Uh, but once we did the peak, it started to come down again. We got into the summer, virtually no deaths in the summer. And as we came into the winter, into 2001, we can see the death rate slowly climbing to normal levels. And as we can see from the uh, COVID graph from the government's official website, almost identical, the almost vertical climb in the number of deaths coming down into the summer, and as we're heading into November, back to normal seasonal death rates again. So, how did we cope with it back in 2000? Well, obviously at this point here, we've seen that the death rate's starting to rise. So this must have been where we went into lockdown. And once we'd hit the peak, we flattened the curve, come back down to almost normal levels. This is where we came out of lockdown. And shortly after, we were able to open up all the pubs and restaurants again and get back to some kind of normal life. Of course, we were worried about a second wave. So at this point, in the middle of summer 2000, we mandated masks in all shops. And heading into the winter, we brought in the rule of six and the 10 p.m. curfew. Well, of course, this never happened, did it? Which begs the question, why are we doing it now? You might be thinking things weren't quite as bad back then as they are now. So let's have a quick look at the BBC's website from the year 2000. So as we can see, hospitals in Liverpool cancelling all non-emergency surgery. Patients waiting overnight on trolleys. And every single ICU bed in London is full. And here we see Eastbourne with its elderly population. 100% increase in the number of patients admitted to its wards. And similar stories reported in Nottingham, Bristol and many parts of Scotland. The flu has now reached epidemic proportions. And we have nursing staff unable to cope under the heavy workload. Well, this doctor from South Wales came up with a novel solution. Perhaps curry was the answer. Should the government be telling us to all eat a lamb madras rather than wait for a vaccine? So, what should we be doing? Well, obviously we need to be shielding those in the high risk group. I mean, I'm not talking about locking them away forever, never visiting them. Um, I think we need to use some common sense here. And, well, the data's now in. You are 20 times more likely to die from COVID-19 if you have low vitamin D levels. Now, you should be able to get this test done on the NHS. If you can't, if you can't get into your doctor, um, Thriver do do a home testing kit, finger prick test, where you just drop a sample into a little test tube and send it back to them. I think it costs about £9, so it's not ridiculously expensive. And if you have got low vitamin D levels, then what can you do about it? Well, the sun is the obvious thing, but of course we're now going into the winter. I think what most of us should have been doing is getting as much sun exposure as we could during the summer. 
So the next best thing is diet. And one excellent source is oily fish. Free range eggs. Full fat dairy. And red meat. But you also may want to consider oral supplementation or light therapy. But as always, do your research and consult your doctor before doing anything drastic. Now, this one's the biggie and nobody's talking about it. This, in my mind, is the biggest killer worldwide today. Insulin resistance is the main driver for obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's and quite a lot of cancers. You probably won't know you've got it and insulin is never tested in the NHS. So, how do you know if you've got it or not? Well, you've got a couple of options really. Uh, you can pay privately. I think you're looking about uh, £130 for an insulin resistance test. Or you can take an educated guess. The first clue that manifests is body shape. Now, if you look like this, then there is a good chance that you are insulin resistant and well on your way to type 2 diabetes. I don't know if Boris is diabetic or not, but I'd lay money on him certainly being insulin resistant. Now, another thing you can do is get a copy of your most recent cholesterol test. Now, this is nowhere near as accurate as testing fasting insulin and fasting glucose, but it does track quite well with insulin resistance. The two that you're interested in are your triglycerides and your HDL levels. Don't worry about your LDL or your total cholesterol. These are of no importance. There is some debate over the figure that you should get. I would say below 1.2, you're not in a bad place. Ideally under 0.7, uh, but less than 1.2, then you're probably going to be insulin sensitive. If you are above 1.2, then certainly removing this tribe of toxic food from your diet is going to be key. Refined sugars, refined grains and industrial seed oils. So bread, cereals, pasta, vegetable oil, sunflower oil, rapeseed oil and other such similar manufactured oils. And then the best thing you can do is return to your herd and try and build up some kind of immunity. And before I finish, I want to mention our Health Secretary, Matt Hancock. Last year, he did everything I've just outlined, improved his own health and lost, I think, about two stone. And Dr David Unwin uh, did suggest that this was probably the key factor in his recovery from coronavirus. We can see here the amount of weight he lost. And of course, he did it with a real food, low carb diet. So to all of you out there who are following this, thinking it's a healthy eating plan, well, think again. Because it's actually written by the who's who of the fake food industry. I don't think people like Greggs and KFC, McDonald's, Mars, Nestle, Coca-Cola, British Sugar should be deciding what's healthy for the British public. So if you've got a copy of that guide, just throw it in the bin and eat real food.